Welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring James Mason and Pamela Colino in Five Fingers. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we bring you another of our 20 greats, Five Fingers, a thrilling drama of a clever spy who sold his services to the highest bidder and recreating his original role of the infamous traitor in this 20th century Fox picture will be James Mason, and as his co-star, his charming wife, Pamela Colino. Now, act one of Five Fingers, starring James Mason as the yellow and Pamela Colino as Countess Stavisky. This account begins in 1944. The war was at its height. But some nations still were neutral. Among them, Turkey. One evening late in March, an attaché of the German embassy at Ankara, a man named Moisich, was about to enter his quarters when a stranger appeared from out of the shadows. Whatever you do, don't raise your voice. Who are you? What do you want? Take me to your office. Either you tell me who you are... Don't be a fool. I've brought you the opportunity of a lifetime. I can make you the envy of the entire German foreign service. Now, open the door. The stranger was in his middle 30s. Well-dressed, and as Moisich soon found out, exceedingly sure of himself. Let me warn you, Moisich. Not one word of this must reach anyone except your ambassador. My life will depend on your discretion. A responsibility I do not choose to accept. I'm afraid you have no choice. Your life will depend upon it, too. You see, certain British documents classed as most secret have come into my possession. The price is 20,000 pounds. English pound sterling. Twenty thousand? Who are you? I am a spy, obviously. I'm also a businessman. And you consider it sound business to pay 20,000 pounds to an unidentified amateur for a set of so-called secret documents? Not so-called, not secret. I said most secret. You will inform Herr von Papen of my offer. Naturally, he'll have to check with Berlin. I'll telephone you on Friday for his answer. I must have more information. If you accept, I'll return at 7 o'clock on Friday evening with two rolls of film containing photographs of the document. And I will receive from you the sum of 20,000 pounds in English banknotes. For each subsequent roll of film, the price will be 15,000 pounds. Is this clear? It's not clear at all. What documents? Containing what? For one thing, the English have been discussing with the Turks their possible participation in the war. A matter of pure supposition. I have the minutes of their secret talks. Your ambassador, Herr von Papen, would be enlightened by them and perhaps a little frightened. What else? The latest Allied plans for the shuttle bombing of certain Balkan targets. When and by whom and how many? Go on. Don't be greedy, Moisic. What do you expect for 20,000 pounds? How did you obtain such information? That is no concern of yours. Nor is my identity. And please do not have me followed. You Germans have no talent for it. You keep wanting to get ahead of the people you follow. Yes, destiny extends its hand to you. Take it and hold on. Good night, Moisich. The men left. Moisich did not have him followed. But had he done so, he'd have discovered that his visitor was in the employ of the British Embassy, the ambassador's valet. And like any proper valet, he was at his post when the ambassador returned shortly before midnight from a reception. A pleasant reception, sir? Diplomatic receptions are never pleasant, D.L.O. The faces may be, but never the motives. Your coat, sir. Allow me. <clears throat> Speaking of pleasant faces, D.L.O., at one time, weren't you in the service of the Countess Stavisky? I was valid to her late husband, sir, at the court of St. James. She was at the reception. Was she well, sir? As charming and lovely as ever, but not so well off. The Nazis in Poland have confiscated everything she owns. I'm sorry to hear it, sir. She was a lady of great wealth. And she used it well. More than anyone I've ever known, Countess de Visky symbolized the world in which she lived. A world of beauty and luxury. Gone forever, I'm afraid. Let us hope not, sir. I put the survey of Turkish manganese beside your bed together with your journal. Oh, yes. Thank you. 
That will be all, Diallo. Uh, one moment, sir. Your capsule. Diallo, have you ever considered the possibility that you might, just for once, forget something? Often, sir. I don't think you'd ever get over it. No, do I. Good night, Your Excellency. <laughs> Three days later, the German ambassador, Franz von Papen, sent for his aide, Moisic. He had just received a dispatch from Berlin. Well, it's here, Moisic. Read it. Transaction approved. Take every precaution. Essential you determine identity of agent. Expect immediate report. It was sent by Kaltenbrunner. Well, here's the money. Ah, 20,000 pounds, eh? Yes. Uh, there's no need to count it, Moisic. I have not taken any of it. Sir, but I had no such intention. Believe me, I was just... Are you uh, sure you can handle this alone? Oh, yes, sir. And I can develop the film myself. Good. The fewer people who know about this, the better. Particularly if this fellow makes fools of us. What was your impression, Moises? Arrogant, spoiled, cynical. A British aristocrat, if I ever saw one, sir. Fantastic. Oh, by the way, a code name has been assigned to him. He used to be referred to as Cicero... Uh, the name is the personal choice of Herr Ribbentrop. Has it any significance, sir? None that I know of, except the surprising fact that Herr Ribbentrop had ever even heard of Cicero. Oh, he'll be here tonight. Uh, he said seven o'clock, sir. Uh, keep your wits sharp. A great deal depends on you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Moisish. Yes, excellent. The money here, you forgot it. Excellent. <laughs> Promptly at 7 o'clock, Diallo arrived at Moisic's office. On the desk lay the pile of banknotes. Ah, you have the money, I see. Thank you, Moisic. The film? Here, two rolls. Yeah. Oh, fetch me a drink while I count it. Will you scotch whiskey, please? I'm sure you must have some. We have the best of ever. Yeah. One of the pleasures of duty in a neutral country. You Germans can drink fine scotch whiskey and your enemies can fill up on fine German beer. Well, you can count the money later. It goes into the safe now until I've developed the film. Are you going to develop the film yourself? Yeah, yes, there's a dark room down the hall. And perhaps you'd better drink this. You're trembling like a butterfly. You'll remain here until I come back. I'll lock the door. I won't open it to anyone but you. Now hurry. Wozich was stunned by the contents of the film, as well he might have been. Back in his office, he did his best to hide his excitement. Interesting snapshots, aren't they? He, uh... The documents seem to be genuine. Don't be pompous, Moisich. My government has authorized me to make further arrangements with you. Splendid. 15,000 pounds for each additional roll of film. Oh, and about my present fee, I've counted the money. It was all there. Well, that money is in the safe. It was. You opened the safe. It's open. You see, I said to myself, if I were an ambitious attaché like Moisich, what would be the combination of my safe? Oh, dear you. And the answer was 1.30.33, the day Hitler came to power. I imagine that that would open half the safes in Germany. What an unimaginative lot you are. <laughs> well, don't be upset, Moisich. There was nothing else worth taking. My, my government is prepared to pay 10,000 pounds per roll. No more. We won't haggle. I risk my life to get these photographs. My price is quite reasonable. You'll pay it. Not until we know who you are and how you obtain such information. That is my business. I will tell you this. I work at the British Embassy. Sooner or later, you'll find that out anyway. You, uh, you have been assigned a code name. Cicero. Cicero. A man of nobility, eloquence, and dissatisfaction. I like that name. When will you bring more film? A week from tonight. Have some money ready. Oh, and change the, the number of the combination. May, may I suggest one? Try 6 18, 15. That's the date of the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> Good night, Herr Moisic. Diallo left. Then he took a walk, which led him to a rather shabby section of town and to a rooming house, the quarters of Countess Anna Stavisky. Oh, it's you, Diallo. Well, come in. Do I disturb you, madam? Not at all. Fortunately, I have a dinner engagement, but he's an undersecretary and he's used to waiting. Any particular undersecretary, madam? Undersecretaries are never particular, Diallo. Perhaps that's why they take me to dinner. It is far more likely that in madam's presence they feel like ambassadors. Of all the diplomats I've ever known, you're still the best. It is my good fortune that you've known so few valets. Diallo, please. 
I've spoken to you before about this. You're the valet to the British ambassador, not to me. Now sit down and tell me the gossip. Uh, I'll begin with the British ambassador, madam. He finds you the most radiant, the most sought-after lady in Ankara. To him, you're a symbol of everything worth having and wanting. A symbol of the good old days, that's me. You see this, Diallo? An emerald, the last of the lot. I want you to take this to the pawn shop tomorrow. I, I couldn't face another trip. Would it not be pleasant to make just one more trip, madam, this time to redeem your jewels? Redeem? With English pounds. Here. Where did you get that money? It's yours, 5,000 pounds. But it can't be real. There's nothing as real as money. But I may never be able to pay this back. I don't want it back. But I can't permit you. It might be the savings of a lifetime. Not savings, madam. I'm not a saving man. A business venture of mine has paid off handsomely. But what has it to do with me? I propose to advance you 5,000 pounds in return for certain favors. I have here another 15,000. I couldn't possibly keep that stem to the embassy, nor do I want to draw attention to myself by depositing it in a bank. But you, madam, could keep it for me. Go on, Diallo. You could leave this grubby room, rent an attractive villa, live as you please. But how would all that be a favor to you? From time to time, I shall want to transact my business in privacy. You would set aside certain quarters for me. I see. If all goes well, I shall have some 200,000 pounds within 12 weeks. That's the amount I've set as my goal. And then? South America. A new life, a new name. That, of course, will require a passport, visas, letters of credit. You could be of great help in obtaining them for me. How? I'll explain that when the time comes. Is there anything else? Nothing. Except all I've told you must remain extremely confidential. Seems little enough to ask for 5,000 pounds. Are you going to tell me what your business is? Sometime, perhaps. Not now. This is quite a trust you put in me. You seem very sure of yourself. I'm sure of you, madam. Oh? For three years, I was valet to your late husband. It is said that no man is a hero to his valet. It is also true that no woman is a mystery to her husband's valet. You know me that well? Well enough. The source of your money has never concerned you any more than the source of your electric lights. They became worrisome only when they were shut off. Quite true, but there is pride. I have pride. A great deal I depend upon your pride. You'll find it intolerable to have it known that your wealth was the gift of a servant. So, you will keep your mouth shut tight. Get me a brandy. There, on the table. Of course. No, Diallo. Not two glasses. I shall drink only out of one, thank you. Do you know why I discharged you after my husband died? I think I do, madam. Because you made me uneasy. I felt you had an evil genius for something. Little did I know it was for making money. That's a lie. That wasn't why I made you uneasy. No? No. You were attracted to me. It was upsetting to feel that way about a valet and to feel that the valet knew it all the time. Have I offended you? You'll soon be very rich. Everything worth having and wanting. The ambassador didn't say that about you. I did. That's how I've always thought about you. And now you want me to go with you to South America? Yes. Away from the war, the intrigue, the fear. And the poverty. And it would be right for us now. Because now, now at last we are equal. Yes. Equals. Who's lying now, Diallo? Where are you going? Madam has a dinner engagement, and we seem suddenly to have run out of gossip. You made me a business proposition. I agree to that part of it. As for the rest, it's not an impossibility. It's merely an improbability, and above all, an impertinence. Because I address you as an equal? No. Because you address me as a servant. Because in the manner of an inferior, you tried to buy something you didn't think you merited on your own. Now, let's get down to the details of business. As madam wishes. My name is Anna. Uh, yes, Anna. Thank you. It was inevitable, of course, that the British embassy would discover that many of their carefully guarded secrets were now known to the Nazis. When this disturbing news reached London, a counter-espionage agent named Travers was sent to the ambassador at Ankara. 
We've made all sorts of preliminary checks, Mr. Travers. So far, we failed. I haven't the slightest idea how the German embassy is getting this information. And if I were to assume that the source is someone here, here at the embassy, sir? But all our personnel and permanent employees have had security clearance from London. Now, forgive me, but I've never known a self-respecting spy without security clearance. And where do you store your state papers, sir? Right here in my study, and that's safe. What about the code room? McFadden can answer that. The code room is under constant guard, night and day. Sir Frederick... Don't you think that this lamentable lapse in security could be due to a slip of the lip at some party or reception? My lips are not in the habit of slipping, Mr. Travers. No, nor do I imply that they are, sir, but our secret information does pass through other hands. It, it might pass through other lips. Now, McFadden's been telling me about an unattached lady, a certain Countess Tavisky. It is possible, is it not, that... I beg your pardon, Your Excellency. What is it, Yellow? It's time for your capsule, sir. Oh, thank you, Yellow. Just set it down. Yes, sir. You were saying, Trevor? Are you a valet? Yes. He's been with me for years. Hmm. Well, uh, about the Countess. According to McFadden, her circumstances have taken a startling change for the better. And does anyone know the source of her sudden good fortune? I'm not able to answer that. However, she has many friends on either side, allied and axis. Hmm. Oh, oh, by the way, you'll be interested to know I'm not the only newcomer to Ankara. Colonel von Richter was also on the train from Istanbul. Von Richter? The Gestapo. Traveling under a Swiss passport. He calls himself Rudolf Hodler, a tobacco buyer from Bern. He went directly to the German embassy, sir. No doubt he's reporting to von Papen as I'm reporting to you. If we only knew what they're saying. Yes, Sir Frederick, if we only knew. Von Papen's reception of von Richter was anything but cordial. Von Papen had good reason to be aroused. So you come here seeking confirmation of the documents we bought from Cicero. You had your confirmation on the 5th of April. We sent you the British plans to bomb the Ploesti oil fields. Well, were they bombed or weren't they? Thousands are dead. Millions of gallons of precious oil destroyed. Well, what is the need for further confirmation, Herr von Richter? Regarding Cicero, it remains the opinion of General Carlton Bruno and myself that all this still could be a British trap. <laughs> Now, then you seem very certain about a connection between the Countess de Visky and Cicero. May I ask why? Because it is obvious. Why else would he choose her new home for his next meeting with Moisish? What a strange and sudden and perfect relationship. Too strange, too sudden, too perfect. The unknown Cicero and the well-known Countess, well-known for her anti-German sentiments. Yet only a month ago, she pleaded with me for an opportunity to work in our interests. For love, Herr von Papen, or for money? For money, of course. Alone, until the time when we return her property we confiscated in Poland. I want to talk to Cicero myself. Moises, when do you meet with him next? Uh, Thursday evening, Herr Colonel. Then you will arrange for Monsieur Hodler, the Swiss businessman, to be present. <laughs> On Thursday night, the Countess Tavisky was again entertaining. Among her guests was the tobacco buyer from Switzerland. During the evening, she led him through the house to a secluded wing, where someone was waiting for him. You will find your man in that room, Monsieur Hodler. I shall see that you are not disturbed. Thank you, madame. Are you too a diplomat, monsieur, like Herr Moisich? I suppose you could call me a middleman. There are so many Swiss middlemen. It seems to be a national occupation. And what could be more natural? After all, we Swiss have been in the middle for hundreds of years. Just knock on the door, monsieur. Colonel von Richter, sit down, please. Moisich tells me that you're to be the new intermediary. That is correct. Moisich is too well known here. It'll be safer for me to deal with you. I'm happy to hear it. I share your concern. The Countess, have you told her who I am? Of course not. Does she know the nature of your business? No. Then just what is her relation? My dear Colonel, I did not invite you here to discuss my personal affairs. We have some business to transact. Did you bring the money? You will be paid after we have developed the film. During the past weeks, I have sold Moisic 50 photographs, all of genuine secret documents. That's proof enough of my good faith. Henceforth, you will pay on delivery. No? Well, possibly you're no longer interested in the strategic plans of the Allies for the entire Mediterranean area. 
a second front? I do not know the number of the front. I do know that in these documents, Mr. Churchill keeps referring to the soft underbelly of Europe. Of course, I could take the films to von Papen and ask that he himself query the German high command as to their interest. Very well. Here. 15,000 pounds. Why, you had it with you all the time. Who are you, anyway? If I told you I was the uh, valet to the British ambassador, would you believe me? <laughs> Certainly not. You see? At least tell me why you are selling us this information. I thought it was self-evident for money. Oh, but you must have some other motive. Perhaps you share our disgust with British decadence. If I have a disgust for everything, it is simply for poverty. You sell us information which will help us win the war. Yet you insist upon being paid in money with a very dubious future. British pounds. What makes you think I think Germany will win the war? Apart from the money we pay you, you attach little importance to these documents. Why? In the first place, I cannot sell you the intelligence to make the proper use of them. In the second place, by informing a man about to be hanged of the exact size, location, and strength of the rope... You do not remove either the hangman or the certainty of his being hanged. And now I'm sure you will want to rejoin your party. One week from tonight, I shall have some more film for you. Good night, Colonel. I trust your meeting was a happy one, Monsieur Hodler. Quite satisfactory, thank you. And you will honor us soon again? The honor will be mine. Good night, madame. Ah, how charmingly you Swiss click your heels. Good night, monsieur. We'll continue with Act Two of Five Fingers in a moment. Letters that come to this show from servicemen bear postmarks from all over the world, and it's plain to see that they're having a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions among people of other lands. They're finding out, too, that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. For instance, in Fécamp in northern France, most of the men of the village are fishermen. Before venturing out to sea, they gather in the Notre Dame de Salute Church to make their devotions, seeking divine guidance for a successful trip and safe return. Benediction services are held also in other parts of France, in England and Newfoundland, in Greece and Italy. They're of a religious nature, but uh, fishermen are pretty superstitious, too. Many of them will refuse to join a ship that doesn't have a mascot, and some refuse to sail on certain days or when the tide is running a certain way. They just don't think it'll be lucky for them. Well, all this might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, we have our own traditions about the sea. In some cases, these are religious, too such as the services that are held in San Diego and Wilmington, California, at New Orleans and other fishing centers of Louisiana. We have other customs as far as luck is concerned. The christening of a ship by breaking a bottle of wine or water over its bow. The carrying of a dog, cat, or other animal as a mascot. And the ritual still exists when crossing the equator of initiating the first-timers, introducing them to King Neptune, the royal chaplain, the surgeon, the barber, and the royal baby. It's an enduring custom that dates back into antiquity when men in all seriousness paid homage to the sea gods. These things are a part of our culture, and they have their equivalents among the customs and traditions of other people. The way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill between us and the people of other countries by observing these customs, by learning about them, and by honoring them. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act Two of Five Fingers, starring James Mason as D.L. and Pamela Colino as Countess Tavisky. Two weeks went by. The man known to the British as Diello the Valet and to the Nazis as Cicero the Spy continued his audacious operations. How did he get his information? Months before, he had learned the combination of the safe in the ambassador's study. Removing the documents, he would place them under a lamp. But the ordinary electric light bulb was not bright enough. So he would substitute a much more powerful one. 
and then with a tiny pocket camera, quickly photograph each new document. In a matter of moments, the papers would be back in the safe and the original bulb restored to the lamp. Simple and incredibly bold, and bound sooner or later to be discovered. But not yet. No, not yet. Come in, Biero. Another profitable evening? Profitable enough to bring the total to 75,000 pounds. Why don't you stop now? Why go on playing with fire? What makes you think I am? Oh, don't treat me like an idiot, child. Your friend Hodler, he isn't Swiss. I know a Prussian when I see one. Does it matter to you? Your safety matters to me. My security depends upon yours. Oh, forgive me. I keep thinking of myself as a man. I keep forgetting that I'm a valet who pays dividends. I can't see why a man as rich as you should go on pressing the trousers of the British ambassador. That's where I get my money. I steal the loose change from his pockets. (laughs) Before you go, get me a drink, will you? Tell me, where do you plan to settle when you go to South America? Rio. There's no city like it in the world. When did you decide to go there? Many years ago, I was a cabin boy on a dirty tramp steamer. I can remember looking up at a villa high on a mountainside above the harbor. I could see a man on a balcony. He was wearing a white dinner jacket. He seemed close enough to touch, and yet he was beyond the reach of anyone. I swore then that someday I would be that man. My drink, please. Do you have a nationality, D.L.O.? You are not a native Englishman, are you? Albanian, English by adoption. In England, it seemed profitable to become a gentleman, so I went into service. As you have pointed out, I am not yet a gentleman, but I am the best of the gentlemen's gentlemen. Which reminds me, the ambassador will be wondering what has kept me. D.L.O.? Yes, Anna? I think I shall find Rio very much to my liking. You've waited a long time to kiss me. You don't have to wait any longer. Anna. Yes, Diallo. Get me a drink. During the following weeks, Diallo's fortune grew to 155,000 pounds. And yet, despite the unerring accuracy of the information which he sold to the Germans, they stubbornly and amazingly refused to act upon it, still afraid that Diallo was really a British agent. At the British Embassy, Travers, the counter-espionage officer, continued on the merry-go-round which had led him exactly nowhere. But one morning, he asked the ambassador to send for Diallo. We feel you can help us, dear Lord. After all, you were valid to the husband of Countess de Visky for some time. I'm sure you learn more about both of them than we could in a lifetime of investigation. Infinitely more, Mr. Travers. Oh, tell me, did you ever hear the Countess express sympathy for the Nazis? To my knowledge, the Countess never spoke of countries or of political parties, sir. The world to her was made up of individual people whom she either liked or disliked. Well, would you consider her to have been pro-German? The Countess was capable of being pro-anything, sir, if it made for a congenial dinner party. Uh, Would you consider it possible for her to have become a German agent? Only for money, sir. Of which she has suddenly acquired a most generous supply. I... (laughs) I know nothing about spies, of course, but I can remember that the Countess had a remarkable talent for receiving confidences from important people. The late Count always relied upon her for acquiring information. Uh, Thank you, Diallo. That's all. Oh, I'll be dining at the American Embassy. You may take the evening off. Uh, Thank you, sir. Mm. Clever chap. He told us nothing. The fact remains that von Papen still anticipates every move I make. Well, Travers, no argument? No, Your Excellency. No argument. That same evening, Colonel von Richter was once again at Countess Stavisky's home, meeting with Diallo. You're very nervous tonight, Colonel. Is something troubling you? This house is far too dangerous a meeting place for us. I wouldn't be surprised if the British were watching it. Not yet, but they will. They suspect the Countess is a German agent. Are you serious? And all the while you suspected she was a British agent. Amusing, isn't it? We should never have met here. From now on, we won't. Do you know the Aslan Hane Mosque in the old quarter? Hmm? Moisich will find it for you. 
We'll meet there a week from tonight. A week is too long. It must be sooner. Really? Why? Because there is something about which we must secure information as quickly as possible. A certain code word has appeared in several of the documents you brought us last week. The word is Overlord. We are convinced that Overlord is the name for their so-called second front. What we must know is the place and date, the where and the when. I can understand your curiosity. I will pay you well for it, 40,000 pounds. Generous of you. But is information of that nature likely to turn up at the British Embassy in Ankara? Don't you read the documents you sell us? I photograph everything that's stamped secret, most secret, and top secret. I'm not particularly interested in what they contain. You photographed the dispatch last week stating that the ambassador would receive a copy of the revised strategic plan for Overlord within ten days. Hmm. Forty thousand pounds, you said. For the where and the when. We'll meet at the Aslan Hani Mosque on Thursday night. Bring the money with you. In the morning, Mr. Travers, for the first time, had some good news for the ambassador. The British had succeeded in breaking the diplomatic code of the Nazi ambassador, von Papen. And now, for a change, sir, you can eavesdrop on von Papen. All right, McFadden, read the message. Uh, this is from von Papen, sir, to the Reich Foreign Minister in Berlin. In reply to your query concerning the authenticity of documents obtained from Cicero, I am firmly convinced the material is genuine. Cicero lives within the British Embassy. Obviously, he has access to top-secret information. Lives here? Carlton Brunner's failure to evaluate the documents and von Richter's refusal to make them available to me is a tragic blunder. I strongly urge you to bring this matter to the personal attention of the Führer. Without delay, signed von Papen. Cicero. The code name for their informer, sir. Now, with your permission, I'll order a house search at once. But an open search will put him right on his gun. Well, that can't be helped. If we can't catch him, we've got to frighten him. Enough to make him stop for a while. As you know, I'm expected in Cairo tomorrow evening. Until I return, take any security measure you think necessary. Well, for one thing, I suggest the combination on your safe be changed and safety devices installed. A dozen members of the staff here have access to most of your secret documents. And there's also McFadden, and you, and I. Cicero could be any one of us. Yes, sir, any one of us. Uh, well, McFadden, better start changing that combination. How long will it take? Oh, a few days, sir. But I can install a, an alarm bell in a matter of hours. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. About your trip to Cairo, shall I pack your uniforms? I won't be needing them. Thank you, dear Lord. Very well, sir. I'll close your bags. Uh, by the way, Yellow, don't be upset if these gentlemen ransack my quarters while I'm gone. Oh, there'll be no need for that, I'm sure, sir. On Thursday night, Moisich and von Richter appeared as scheduled at the entrance of the Aslan Hane Mosque. But the man they were looking for was not there. It's never been late before, sir. Never. Could it be possible, sir, that the British have found him out? It is more possible that the British have known about him all the time. It is very curious how easily Cicero acquired the documents he wanted to sell. And when only once we named the information we want to buy, how mysteriously he failed to deliver it. What does the Colonel propose to do now, sir? Precisely nothing. All spies in time outlive their usefulness. I'm afraid, Moises, that... Your friend Cicero has just about outlived his. Now, drive me back to the embassy. No, Diallo did not appear that night at the mosque. He went instead to call on the Countess Stavisky. So you can be very proud of me, Diallo. You have everything you asked for. Your passport, your visas, and your tickets. Your name is now Roberto Antonini. Well done, Signora Antonini. It was nothing. One of my many pleasant wifely duties. How much do they cost? Five thousand pounds. Another thousand for birth and marriage certificates. And the tickets? Two first-class compartments, separate cars on the Istanbul Express leaving tomorrow evening. And the ship? An Argentine passenger freighter sailing from Istanbul directly to Rio. Day after tomorrow at sundown. Now remember, you're to take no notice of me whatsoever on the train. When we reach Istanbul, we'll go aboard the ship at once. How does it go at the bank? The bank manager seemed extremely curious. But the papers will be ready tomorrow morning. How much? Another thousand. Yeah. 
And all my powers of persuasion, this side of respectability. That leaves roughly 130,000 pounds. In dollars, about 600,000. In Brazilian cruceros, about uh, 11 and a half million. Plus the 40,000 you got tonight. No, I withdrew from that transaction. The market's getting shaky. I've decided to retire. You have before you an Argentine gentleman of leisure, about to take up residence in Brazil. I'm glad. We have more than enough anyway. We? We have more than enough? My dear Senora Antonini, where I came from, a man's money is his own. And if his wife is a good wife, he gives her some from time to time. Whatever you say, Roberto. Will you miss being a countess? Not for a moment, darling. Not for a moment. In the morning, Mr. Travers, for the first time, had reason to specifically question the ambassador's valet. Uh, Diello, may I ask what you're doing with those letters? These, sir? Mr. Morrison gave them to me. The ambassador's personal mail, sir. Oh, I, I see. Perhaps you'd better take charge of it, sir, until he returns from Cairo. Yes, I, I think we'd better put it in the safe. Uh, how many letters are there? Uh, five, sir. Oh. Oh, this one seems quite personal. A lady's handwriting... Uh, you were looking at it, weren't you? It's perfumed, sir. It struck me as such a pity that so few ladies use perfumed letter paper these days. By the way, Diello, weren't you away from the embassy last night between 9 and 10? Uh, yes, sir. Would you mind accounting for your movements? Not at all, sir. I walked for a while on the boulevard, stopped for a drink at the Yuxel Palace, then back to the embassy. Now, one other question about the Countess. Do you remember any particularly close friend she may have had in Switzerland? Did she go there often? Oh, very often, sir. She was extremely fond of Switzerland. Ah, then that explains it. Countess Tavisca left for, by plane for Switzerland this morning. I hope she can enjoy it in the style to which she is accustomed. Now, well, that shouldn't be any problem. She took with her 130,000 pounds. I wonder where she got it. Yes. I wonder, sir. In a moment, Act Three of Five Fingers. The town of Kotzebue, Alaska, had very little defense against the fire which raced through it on a winter's night. In a few hours, houses, stores, and other buildings had burned to the ground, and many people were homeless. But a unit from the 11th Air Division, stationed nearby, took charge and made space for the people to stay overnight, set up temporary shelters and mess tents. And the next day, they set to work to rebuild the town. On off-duty hours throughout the next few weeks, they worked as carpenters, painters, bricklayers, plumbers, and electricians. And from their example, the people of Kotzebue took heart. As the town was rebuilt, so their hope for the future was rekindled. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. Rises on Act Three of Five Fingers, starring James Mason as Diello and Pamela Colino as Countess Tabisky. To Diello, the news was unthinkable. Anna Stavisky had stolen his money and gone to Switzerland. He hurried away from the embassy, went to a cafe, and telephoned Moisich. Listen carefully, Moisich. Tell Colonel von Richter I have decided to get the information about Overlord. I, uh, I need the money. But I'm being watched. I'll arrange a meeting place in Istanbul. I'll call you there tomorrow at the German consulate. phone call, Diello came directly back here to the embassy. Now, did he speak to anyone at the bar? No, no one. I think you're on the wrong track sniffing after Diello. After all, he didn't bat an eye when you told him about the Countess. But why go to a cafe to make a telephone call? And why did he... Well, 
Well, maybe you're right. Where is he now? Upstairs. If he should leave again, he'll be followed, of course. Yes, the yellow was upstairs, staring at the ambassador's safe and the newly installed wiring that led up to the hall to an electric alarm bell. In the safe was a secret worth 40,000 pounds. But one turn of the dial and the entire British embassy would descend upon him. But then he smiled. How simple it would be. Diallo walked down the hall to a broom closet. and it was a fuse box. He removed the fuse that served the ambassador's study and thus broke the current to the alarm bell. Two minutes later, he was taking photographs of half a dozen papers containing the word overlord. And then, there was no time to return the documents to the safe. No time for anything but to find out who was at the door. What do you want? I am the porter, sir. I clean the office now. No, not now. His Excellency won't be back until tomorrow. But it is necessary... Not now, I, I said. Come back later. But the porter was not one to quickly surrender. If he could not tidy up the study, at least he could vacuum the carpets in the corridor. But when he turned on the vacuum cleaner, there was no electricity. So he went to the broom closet, observed that a fuse was missing, and promptly replaced it. Hey, where you are, dear? That man, where did he go? Did you see him? What man? Who? The man. He'll get away. Where's the yellow, my cousin? He just ran out. Back stairs. He's chasing someone. Johnson. Yes, sir. You and Kimball follow him. Find him and stick with him. Right out. Morrison, get a dispatch off to London. I want all available information on the yellow sent here at once. All right, McFadden, let's take a look at the safe. Well, the papers are all here. Now, now, what about the letters? That batch of mail that came for the ambassador. Yeah, and there were five letters. One letter's missing. The one with the delicate perfume. One letter gone, but none of the papers. I wonder why he'd... What's that light in the bedroom? Huh? Lamps on. An unusually bright lamp, isn't it? Come here. A photographic bulb. Why, he photographed... All right, all right. Have Burroughs and Murray watch the German embassy. We've got to keep him from delivering that film. Grab him in public? Our Turkish friends might not like him. If we can't kidnap him, McFadden, we'll have to kill him. There's a little matter called Overlord we've got to consider. Now, send a man out to the airport. After Johnson gets back, you and I will get out to the railroad station. If he doesn't show up at their embassy, you can be sure he's leaving town. At the German embassy, Colonel von Richter was also making plans, based on Diallo's phone call from the cafe to Moises. He said he would arrange a meeting in Istanbul. Very well. Uh, see, but you and Sturgeon take the train. Moises and I will go by plane. Cicero is bound to be on one or the other. Shall we go armed, Colonel? Naturally. You are to protect Cicero from the British at all costs until we get that film. And after that, sir? And after that, Moises. It will be up to Cicero to protect himself from the British and from us. At the crowded railroad station, four men kept their tense watch for Diallo. Two British, two Nazis. But there was no sign of Diallo. Not until the train started to move from the platform. And then from his hiding place, Diallo dashed through the crowd and onto the train. I've gone through the last three cars. No sign of him. He's in the car just ahead. Second compartment. The door's closed. Well... Well, there's nothing to do between here and Istanbul, but make sure that none of them get off. Them? Down there. The old familiar faces. Oh, the same two we saw in the station. But what if he's given them the film? Well, they wouldn't be playing watchdog for him if he did. So put your gun away, McFadden, and light up your pipe. It's a long ride to Istanbul. In his compartment, Diallo was reading a letter. A letter with the delicate scent. Addressed to the British ambassador. And so, by the time you receive this letter, I shall be far from Ankara. Far from uncertainty and hunger and humiliation. I shall be settled, I hope, in a new life of security and self-respect. You have spoken to me so often, my dear ambassador of Diallo, the perfect valet. Surely I can offer no greater proof of my devotion to the allied cause than to inform you that your trusted DLO is a German spy. I know both you and your government 
Early the following morning, Diello left his compartment and entered another. Good morning, gentlemen. Did you sleep well? I slept extremely well. Guards to the right of me, guards to the left of me. You are my bodyguard, aren't you? Or are you my assassins? We are here to see that no harm comes to you from the British. We will stay at your side till you reach the German consulate. Don't be whimsical. I'm here only to give you a message from Moisich. Tell him to meet me at Harkin's restaurant at 6 o'clock this evening. We would prefer the consulate. No, thank you. So many more people go into German consulates than come out of them. We must have some guarantee that your film is genuine. Here is a little strip of film. Have Moisich develop it, and you will see a piece of the document that Colonel von Richter wants to buy. I'll deliver the rest of it when Moisich pays me 100,000 pounds. 100,000? Uh, I forgot to tell you, I've just raised my price. At six o'clock in Istanbul, in a restaurant called Hakim's, Moisic kept his appointment with Diallo. Some moments later, they were followed there by Travers and McFadden. Good evening, gentlemen. You wish a table? I'm looking for a friend. He, uh, he'll be in a private room. There is a private room over there. It is occupied. Mm, good. Then he's here. I am sorry. He does not wish to be disturbed. No, but he's expecting us. I am sorry. If you care to wait, please to be seated here. Well, he's here, McFadden, and Moisich is in there with him. You know, there's a time for using your wits and a time for blasting away. Let's get it over with. Well, we've no monopoly on blasting away in this place. Oh? Our Nazi friends again? And those dim-witted supermen would drop us before we got clear of the table. But he may be handing over the film this minute. As of this minute, we don't want the film. Plans can be changed, you know. We want the yellow. We've got to know just how much the Nazis have found out. I'm going to send him a note. Just a word or two to let him know we're protected. Oh, you're balmy. Now you jump at it. Oh, uh, are you? If you don't mind. Yes, sir? My friend may not know we're waiting for him. Would you give him this note, please? That note you just got. Who is it from? What does it say? Ah, you're troubled, Moisich. Because you know that I haven't much longer to live. The two Gestapo men are here to protect you from the British. What two men? Really, Moisich, you and your guilty conscience and your big mouth. Well, the money is all in order, and here is the film. Good. Has it occurred to you that our roles are now reversed? That the British may try to kill you? Well, Moisich, shall we go? Here he comes. He's heading towards us, Travers. Your note worked. Mr. Travers, I'm touched by your solicitude. Imagine me, of all men, with a British sword and a British shield. Personally, I'd rather slit your throat. Impractical. In that case, I'd be unable to tell you the things you want to know. You've no idea how confused the Nazis are to see you protecting me. They still half suspect I've been a British plant all along. Well, we have a car outside. We'll see you safely to the British consulate. Uh, no, no thank you. We'll walk away together and then say goodbye. We'll get the Turkish police to arrest you. Is that a gun in your pocket, Mr. McFadden? It's against the law here to carry a weapon, didn't you know? Come along. Of course. You disapprove of me, don't you, Mr. Travers? You're the most cold-blooded traitor I've seen in a lifetime of looking at human trash. What a pity. I rather hoped I looked like a gentleman. <laughs> They left the restaurant. Behind them came the two Gestapo men, Siebert and Starbin. But Diallo had known exactly what he was doing when he picked Hakim's as the meeting place. For the narrow street was jammed with people and traffic. They walked not more than 50 feet when he suddenly darted away and was lost in the crowd. Meanwhile, Moisic had rushed to the German consulate with a roll of film that had cost 100,000 pounds. The film is developed, Herr Colonel. I have the, exactly the information you wanted. Oh, have you? Yeah. It took you long enough? Yes, I was so nervous, I spoiled the first print. But, but here it is, sir. D-Day for Operation Overlord is tentatively set for early June along the coast of Normandy and the Cherbourg Peninsula. Colonel, did you hear me? Now you hear this. Huh? An urgent dispatch from von Poppen. 
von Tarte. I have just received personal letter from Countess Anna Stavisky naming Cicero as British agent. I am unable to confirm accusation because Countess is now in Switzerland. But in view of past efforts to ingratiate herself with us, I am compelled to believe her charge is true. I cannot believe it. I have always believed it from the first. But the documents were genuine. Events prove them genuine. Of course, they had to be. So that we would swallow that big lie, that one in your hand. I knew it. All along, I knew it. Lies, lies, lies. Yes, the yellow had won. And as Roberto Antonini, he sailed away to Rio. He bought a magnificent home high on a hill overlooking the harbor. And he wore a beautiful white dinner jacket every night. But one evening as his valet was serving dinner out on the balcony, two gentlemen came to call on him. This is an unexpected pleasure, Senor da Costa. And may I present my friend, Senor Santos. I am honored, Senor. Are you two associated with the bank? No, Senor. With the Brazilian Department of Investigation. And you have discovered some irregularity in my papers? Your papers are all perfectly in order. Uh, uh, there is an irregularity, however. Your account at the bank, senor. I'm overdrawn. As of yesterday, I had approximately seven million cruzeiros in my account. I, uh, I was referring to the 25,000 pounds in cash with which you purchased this villa. The money has been returned. What on earth for? It is counterfeit. You have a distorted sense of humor, senor. And so is the money which you exchanged for Brazilian currency. It is all counterfeit. The most skillful I have ever seen. Uh, senor Antonini, I implore you to cooperate. Those counterfeit notes were printed in Germany. The British have just established that beyond a doubt. And so far they have turned up in three places. Here in Brazil, in Turkey, and in Switzerland. Switzerland? Over 100,000 counterfeit British pounds confiscated there two days ago. In the possession of a political refugee, a lady, a uh, count. Now, it will be to your interest, senor, to tell us where and how you got this money. Switzerland. <laughs> now, believe me, senor, this is no laughing matter. <laughs> it is my unhappy duty to inform you you are under arrest. Anna! <laughs> I beg your pardon. Anna, poor little Anna! <laughs> moment, our stars will return. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. G.J. Watamool, a naturalized United States citizen, has done much to bring the fruits of democracy to his native country, India. As one of Hawaii's most successful merchants, Watamool, with his American wife, established the Watamool Foundation over 15 years ago to bring Indian students to America. The first year, they offered 14 fellowships, paid for the students' passage to the United States and their tuition at the University of the Candidate's Choice, and gave them $150 a month for two years' living expenses. Since the foundation was begun, industries all over America have offered their services to the Watamools in helping Indians learn modern techniques in pediatrics, the control of epidemics, food canning, and the building of machinery. Through the years, the Watamools have expanded their program to sponsor and exchange goodwill ambassadors between the United States and India. We should be especially proud of G.J. Watamool, who, as an American citizen, has proven to peoples of two nations that by helping others, you help your country. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And here they are, James Mason and Pamela Colino. Now, Irving, what about next week? It's just out of this world, Pamela. In fact, that's where we're going for the story, because it's Paramount Pictures' shocking story of the War of the Worlds. And as our star of this science fiction thriller, we'll have Dana Andrews and Pat Crowley. That should be quite exciting, Irving. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'll be seeing you Thursday night. <laughs> 
Heard in our cast, right, were William Conrad as the narrator, Hans Conried as Moisich, Herb Butterfield as Sir Frederick, John Dodsworth as Travers, Edgar Barrier as von Poppen, Harley Bear as von Richter, Leo Brett as McFadden, and Vic Perrin, Lou Krugman, Lawrence Dobkin, and Eddie Marr. Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the Hollywood Radio Theater, a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.